Hey everybody, welcome to um, our second lecture on um, pragmatics and SLA. And today I'm going to talk with you um, about some of the applications of the cooperative principle and um, some of the applications of very basic ideas of politeness. We're not going to go um, deep into first and second, third wave stuff that you've done with Dr. Rotato. We're just going to look at um, some sort of general remarks about what's been done with politeness and SLA. So let's start with a um, review of the cooperative principle. Make your conversational contribution such that it's required, stage at which it occurs, by the accepted purpose and the exchange in which you're engaged, right? Which comprises, is comprised of these uh, four maxims, uh, relevance, quality, quantity, and manner. And I know you did all this work with Dr. Otado. So um, you also looked with him um, about what happens with failure to observe the maxim. So there are different ways in which that can occur, right? One is a violation. So that's very simply not following the cooperative principle, which we wouldn't expect. Opting out, which is refusing to continue communication on the basis that you know you're going to have to violate it. A clash, which is when two maxims uh, make conflicting demands, or flouting, which is blatantly failing to fulfill a particular maxim while observing the overall cooperative principle. So, this might be if somebody says, Oh, how do I look in this dress? and you say, Oh, great, when you know that's not necessarily. Um, uh, following the maxim of quality, but that you know that that's the best um, answer. Okay. So um, what the CP does is guide our interpretive analysis of the meaning of the sentence in context, right? So it allows us to extract not only the what is said, but also a figurative meaning called the implicature. Um, the example that I'm going to give you here, I think um, Dr. Tyler has given you already, but here's an example. I have read many books by Chomsky, is the statement that someone makes, right? The speaker has told me that he has read many books by Chomsky. I assume that the speaker is following the cooperative principle. So this is a true and relative state, uh, relevant statement. Um, and I also assume that it follows the maxim of quantity. Therefore, the speaker is giving me just the right amount of information, not too much, not too little. So if in fact he had read all of Chomsky's books, the appropriate um, maxim of quantity would be that he had read them all, right? So the fact that he says he's read many books has this implicature that he has not read all the books of Chomsky. Right. Okay. So that's just a little bit of a review. Um, when it comes to ESL and EFL teaching, um, it's often noted that textbooks avoid almost any discussion of implicature and uh, seem to teach the language as though it doesn't exist because obviously it's a little complicated. So one of the biggest um, uh, researchers in this area is Bouton, and he said in 1994, little attempt is made in the ESO EFL classroom to make learners aware of implicature as a tool of communication or to give them practice using it in English. So what that means is if as a teacher you want to cover that material, then you're going to have to do it yourself okay so any real coverage is dependent on you and if you can find any materials that allow you to cover that all right so what we're going to do is look at a couple of studies of um second language acquisition of uh implicature in the classroom and see um what that looks like so the first person that um, we're going to look at, and we're going to use this as an example, um, is Armstrong, 2007. 
So um, an example of a statement, so uh, what is said, so the literal statement would be, did you live in Tokyo for a long time? Yes, uh, five years, right? And then an example with a clear implicature would be, did you live in Tokyo for a long time? Yes, an eternity, okay? Which gives the implicature, the implied meaning that she lived in Tokyo a lot longer than she really wanted to, okay? So that would be what we would want to test our second language learners on, right? Do you understand that yes, an eternity has the, it doesn't mean literally, I lived there for eternity. The, um, what it does is give an implicature that she wasn't necessarily very happy there. So um, what literature there is um, suggests that uh, cultural background is a good predictor of non-native speaker ability to interpret implicature. Seems the sort of culturally closer you are to uh, the implicatures that are being given in the other culture, um, the more likely it is that you might pick it up. Um, although that's, um, uh, you want to be a little bit careful about what we mean when we say uh, a culture is closer or distant to another culture. Um, explicit instruction can improve learners' ability to interpret implicatures, and we'll look at that in just a second. And also, again, as we said last week, proficiency does play a role. Lower level learners rely more on bottom-up processing, so background knowledge, keyword inferencing, taking individual keywords from the statements, rather than thinking about um, a script or schema in which this might appear. So, um, oops, um, proficiency levels, uh, high proficiency learners, and there are really um, not so many studies on this, so we, we're looking at a few. There are some more, um, but generally speaking, this is an under-researched area. Um, high proficiency learners outperform lower proficiency learners. Um, low proficiency learners focused mainly on bottom-up processing and um, Taguchi also looked at study abroad and she found that study abroad experience improved implicatures that relied on routine expressions so expressions like idiomatic expressions that the learners would hear again and again and again but didn't necessarily improve their understanding of indirect implicatures overall right Um, so there are a lot of constraints, right, on learning implicatures in the classroom and um, the cooperative principle in general um, when you try and do this, because as we've said before, you only have the teacher, the materials and the other learners. Well, the teacher may not be very conversant with the, I mean, they, they would intuitively understand the idea of implicature, but wouldn't necessarily know how to approach that in a classroom. As we've said, materials are often lacking in terms of even considering the notion of indirect communication. And we looked at that also last week with uh, indirect complaints. And then you have the other learners who, who um, particularly if you're in an EFL situation, you wouldn't expect to um, have any necessary insight into that. So Washburn also sort of details those issues with classroom learning. Um, there's often a lack, and this is particularly true of EFL, but it's also true often of ESL. There's a lack of varied, varied nat naturally occurring input. There's a lack of salience in that input, a lack of awareness. And again, we talked about this last week, this idea that 
you really have to address all aspects of pragmatics. So um, uh, different relationships um, between uh, unequals, for example, um, all the things that we talked about um, last week. And then often a lack of direct or explicit feedback with regard to any violation of norms. All right, so let's look at whether they can be taught. And again, there's really not much here, um, but it, this will give you an idea of the kind of research that has been done and could be done to sort of try and get to the heart of whether learners are actually um, understanding indirect communication and implicature. What Bhutan found after uh, several studies was that some implicatures were easier for learners to understand than others. For example, when he did a control taught group and an, um, an uncontrolled, uh, excuse me, a control taught group and then a group that didn't have any specific instruction, both those groups understood the implicature in something like, how about going for a walk, but isn't it raining out? Okay, so both groups, whether they were taught about implicature and indirect communication or not, understood that that meant, hmm, you know, why would we do that? Because it's raining outside, right? The difference came in more um, sophisticated, I guess, um, ideas of implicature. So there's one, um, I'm not sure if Dr. Ricciardo talked about this one or not, but there's something called the Pope uh, question implicature, which is something like, well, um, uh, here's an example. Does Dr. Walker always give a test the day before vacation? Um, is the Pope Catholic is the Pope implicature question. In this case, it's does the sun come up in the east, right? So does Dr. Walker always give a test the day before vacation? Does the sun come up in the east? Is the Pope Catholic? Yes, he always does that just before um, vacation, right? This is a very common, um, easily understood implicature in um, inner circle, uh, English is American, British, and so on. Another one that only the taught group did well in and not the untaught group was um, irony. And this I've actually um, cut and paste for you, which is why it's a little small, but it says Bill and Peter work together in the same office. They are sometimes sent on business trips together and are becoming good friends. They often have lunch together and Peter has even invited Bill to have dinner with him and his wife at their home on several occasions. Now Peter's friends have told him that they saw Bill out dancing with Peter's wife recently while Peter was on out of town on a business trip. On hearing this, Peter's comment was, Bill knows how to be a really good friend, doesn't he? which I'm sure we all understand as, as being ironic, right? He, he doesn't think that his friend taking his wife out while he's out of town is a friendly thing to do. Maybe there's something funny going on or um, Peter would like something to be going on, right? So that's the ironic tone. And what he found was that the untaught group, so the, the group that, wasn't, that didn't directly discuss implicature or indirect communication, didn't understand either of those. They got both of those uh, ideas incorrect, right? The only one that they understood was the easier one, the how about going for a walk, isn't it raining out? Um, Kim did a similar study based on the Bhutan study to find out not only whether um, the Korean EFL teachers understood the implicature, but also um, did the study in such a way to find out how they got to the step-by-step -step explanation of, of 
their understanding of the implicature, right? Regardless of whether it was correct or incorrect. Um, they were asked um, to answer a multiple choice question as to what the implicature was. And they were also then asked to do a step-by-step -step explanation of how they got there, how that's the answer they got to. So Kim used a, is the Pope Catholic implicature? Um, the scenario is Frank is a big sports fan. Jim says, did you see the game last week? Frank says, is the Pope Catholic, right? So of course I saw the game last week, right? Um, so, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, Kim gave the multiple choice responses, right? So Frank is a big sports fan. Did you see the game last week? Is the Pope Catholic? This means what? A, Frank saw the game. B, Frank didn't see the game. C, Frank wants to know if the Pope is Catholic. Or D, Frank is more interested in religion than sports. And found that most of the Korean EFL teachers could not um, uh, identify the implicature and gave the wrong answer on the multiple choice. So then they looked at the step-by-step -step explanations of, of why they came up with the answer that they came up with. And you could see some of these mistakes that they were making. So here's one example of an incorrect um, understanding and that should say feel. So they incorrectly identified um, something else, not the correct implicature. And when they were asked how they came to this understanding, they said, when people take part in the Pope Catholic, so this is um, uh, ESL, uh, EFL teachers, so I, I left the incorrect syntax as it was. When people take part in the Pope Catholic ceremony, they can feel it's too long or peaceful or boring. Because Frank is a big sports fan, he saw the game and was disappointed that the game was boring. So this is the sense that they had. They didn't get any, they literally were using the idea of um, the Pope and religion rather than this idea of figuratively is the Pope Catholic. Here's another example. Um, they decide Frank is a big sports fan. So Frank sees all the sorts of games that are not prohibited. Frank thinks only Pope Catholic are prohibited from seeing sports games. So again, you see that the explanation that the um, second language learners come up with sort of takes this idea of the Pope and the Catholic being a literal idea, not this figurative understanding of um, the implicature. Um, what was interesting was with, um, uh, and I think I somehow managed not to put that in there, but um, with direct instruction, explicit instruction, um, these EFL Korean teachers got a lot better at understanding um, implicature and what was going on. Um, but the initial response was to take the whole thing very literally. Um, this was a study done with undergraduate uh, English teaching as a foreign language students in Egypt. And again, the idea here was to see if with explicit instruction, you could teach students how to understand implicature. So this was a long, uh, uh, fairly long detailed study um, in which the theory was presented, um, the idea of a Gricean analysis of conversation, interpretations of implicature, and then group discussion and practice. And this went on for 12 four hour training sessions over three months. So that's, that's a lot of uh, intervention. Often interventions are much, much shorter than that, but that's a nice solid intervention. And um, 
what that study found that there was significant improvement with direct um, instruction and that the higher the language proficiency, the better able um, speakers were to understand and interpret the implicatures. And in this case, um, the pragmatic competence was correlated with overall language proficiency, which was interesting because in some of the other studies that we looked at last week specifically, um, there wasn't necessarily a direct correlation. But here, there seems to be a quite uh, robust correlation between um, being able to see that something might not have a literal meaning. So being able to pass something at a higher level than at um, a low level block by block. Um, okay. So here is an example of what happened in that test from the tuition. So if we start by actually looking at the um, implicature example. So Jose and Tanya are professors at a college and they're talking about a student, Mark. And Jose says, how did you like Mark's term paper? Tanya says, well, I thought it was well typed. And then they hear a narrator's voice say, how did Tanya like Mark's term paper? And they get the multiple choice examples. He liked it, he thought it was good. B, he thought it was important that it was well typed. C, he hadn't really read well enough to know. And D, he did not like it, okay? So I think <clears throat> most of us would understand that D, he did not like it, would be the um, implicature here. And what they found was that with this kind of direct instruction, they could actually increase um, the control group's ability to understand these implicatures from a um, very low 3.8% of participants to a very robust 88.9% of participants on the post-test. So it was possible. And Again, we talked about this last week, this idea of explicit instruction of pragmatics, that um, generally speaking, this has um, positive correlations in the literature. Um, we don't know, there's not been a lot of very long-term studies, so um, it's unclear how long and how widely they're able to apply it. But certainly um, the explicit pragmatic instruction seems to help a lot. So in summary, with the cooperative principle, basically there's not enough work in this area compared to, for example, speech acts. We looked at speech acts last week and there's tons and tons and tons of work at least in part because it's easy, right? It's a, as I said last week, it's fairly low hanging fruit. You can really make up some, some DCTs without too many problems and so on. Um, a lot, uh, in contrast, a lot of these studies are kind of derivative in the sense that they're using a lot of the same tests. And a lot of the tests were, were Bhutan's original tests in the 1990s, because it's quite hard, right, to make up new tests in terms of implicatures. So people have tended to reuse the same research material over and over again. Um, so there's definitely issues there. And this is definitely an area um, that could use some additional work. But when we look at what is there in general, um, there are some robust conclusions regarding development of pragmatics, including that explicit instruction again is useful. And some specific suggestions if we look back at those studies that were actually done in the classroom, uh, Kim's study in Korea and the study in um, Egypt, then we can say 
um, look, there are ways in which this can be incorporated and probably should be incorporated in um, classroom practice. Okay, so that is the cooperative principle. Do let me know if you have any questions. I'm just going to keep barreling through here today. So um, just let me know. Um, you can email me directly at lucy.pickering at tamuk.edu or you can um, email me through um, Dr. Otada. All right, let's have a brief look at SLA and politeness. Um, so as you know already, uh, politeness is a major determinant of linguistic behavior. Um, and it's the term used to describe the extent of which actions, including the way things are said, match addressees' perceptions of how they should be performed, right? So we all have an idea in our own mind of what is polite behavior and impolite behavior, polite language and impolite language. And um, uh, that's what we're looking at is that sort of um, model that's in our side, our head that we compare real interaction to, right? And we talked about this again last week, really briefly when we said that second language learners um, can either have a very sort of rigid idea of what's polite and impolite or they can have a much more um, nuanced idea uh, depending upon how willing they are to step outside of their own understandings in terms of understanding that these are cultural norms. All right, so I know you've worked with uh, Dr. Otardo and Brown and Levinson and Goffman, and um, most of the work that's been done on politeness in SLA has been done on um, face work um, and images of self, okay? So um, if we look at face work, we've got the idea of building positive face which is the desire to be liked, to be uh, included, to be approved of. So some of the things that tend to positive face that, that um, people give to encourage positive face, compliments, showing interest in something or someone, um, gifts and so on, these all attend to the posit somebody's positive face, right? To make them feel um, part of the community, right? And then the opposite is um, negative face. And that's this idea that simultaneously there's a desire to be not imposed upon, right? So to be um, maybe left alone, to be allowed to be private, to be able to act as one pleases and not to feel that one is um, constantly at the beck and call of others, right? So the kinds of speech acts that attend to negative face would be things like apologies or deferent behavior, uh, offering ways out of requests that you might make and so on by saying you know oh i'm sure you've got a hundred things to do i know you're super busy but i was wondering if so that is um uh you're asking for something um but you're attending to the person's negative face by by saying look i know that you probably can't do this which makes it easier of course for the person to say look i'm really sorry I actually can't do this. Um, you're right, I am super busy and I can't do that. So as I think you've also done uh, with Dr. Otardo, face threatening acts are anything that threatens a person's face, right? So that can cause damage. Um, so it can cause damage to your positive face or your negative face, right? 
So an example is um, asking for something. Anytime you request something from somebody, that is an imposition on the hearer, right? Who has to either deny the request or um, grant it and go against his or her desire not to want to grant that in the first place. So either way, that's going to be a face threatening act, right? Anytime that you make a request, you want to be aware that it's potentially a, a face threatening act, right? Um, and then you also would have looked at um, this idea of um, politeness strategies, right? Um, that you can be bold on record which is um, often what we use with intimates. So, oh, give me that or get me that pen, you might say to your sibling or your husband or your wife or somebody um, that you know well. Um, positive politeness, which attends to the needs of the hearer. So, gosh, you know, um, you did a fantastic job today. Um, this was awesome and you know i feel so lucky that we have you on the team etc cetera, etc cetera. uh negative politeness which would be any kind of mitigation right like i used before oh i know you're super busy and you have a lot of things to do um i'm sure you don't have time but i was wondering if you know um off the record which would be indirect so um oh gosh, I forgot my pen again. I'm always doing this. Rather than saying to me, Lucy, can I borrow, do you have a pen I can borrow? You're just making a statement and hoping that I understand that that means that what you really need is, um, is my pen, right? Or in some cases, in many cases actually, um, there's avoidance, right? So don't do the face threatening act in the first place. Okay. Now we looked at this again last week with the speech act. You remember when we looked at the example in Egypt, um, where they had a couple of scenarios, DCTs, discourse completion, where they said, what would you say if, um, you know, your boss said, I need you to come to this party and bring your wife and it's this Saturday and you have to decline, right? And if you remember that many of the people that were part of that study said, I wouldn't decline, right? I just wouldn't do that. Um, that's not, um, that would be, that face threatening act is such that um, I would only say yes, right? Um, so that's another issue too. And that of course will, will vary depending upon, um, what culture you are part of. So in summary, in terms of where SLA has really gone with this, um, they've looked at face threatening acts, uh, what magnifies the threat, what might decrease the threat with face saving acts uh negative face the need to be independent positive face the need to feel like you belong uh negative politeness recognize the importance of other people's times and concerns and um positive politeness which is the idea of promoting solidarity and common ground right and really the way that this has been looked at is through cross-cultural understandings of what some of these things in general might be within a given culture. So bearing in mind that we all understand that um, speech communities vary uh, even within one culture. Um, some cultures are more highly um homogenous than others right some are more um heterogeneous so we might think of america as more like that and other cultures as less like that so bearing that in mind what scotland and scotland did was say okay let's look at in general terms at how 
cultures seem to understand this idea of um, positive, negative politeness and face threatening acts, right? How in, in very general terms. So again, I reiterate, um, obviously different parts of the community might have different kinds of responses, but this is just a very sort of general um, idea. So some cross-cultural generalizations that Scholar and Scholar have put forward are, for example, um, that British society has strong negative politeness. I, I agree with that. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, very within the norm in terms of Scholar and Scholar's idea of being British and what my reactions might be. I am much more concerned about um, being left um, to my own, you know, being able to make my own decision than I am in um, what we might consider positive politeness being loved or admired by others or whatever. So this is, this is certainly something that I um, am, a, um, am strongly aware of, especially being inside another culture. Uh, Cuban society, they say maximizing praise of others. So in other words, very overt, positive politeness is not considered to be a good thing. And this is often the case in cultures, um, some cultures, because they perceive it as um, uh, not true. Um, it's uh, too exaggerated, which means that you're doing it for the wrong reason. They don't know why you're doing it, but it, it's not the way that it should be. In addition, some cultures, if you are close to somebody, it's your family or your friends, and you maximize positive politeness, you, you start to say, I wonder if it's okay if, you know, you really work with positive face. Some cultures feel that that is a sort of slap in the face, you know, that you should know them well enough and they know you well enough that you would do that for them. They don't, there doesn't need to be this whole show of um, positive politeness or positive face. And in fact, that can make matters worse. So that has been something that's, that's um, come up in several different um, uh, research areas. Um, and Chinese society um, where positive politeness is considered to be the most important, like saying, um, constantly attending to people's um, positive face. I have here any others because normally when I teach this, um, face to face, I will ask whomever else is in the room from different cultures to tell us what they think, just sort of off the top of their head, that their own culture or a culture that they're very familiar with because they're living in a second language culture um, might fall on this kind of spectrum. So I encourage you to do that if you're sitting here. Um, uh, watching this in Japan and you're American or um, in China and you're American or um, you're Taiwanese um, or whatever that you think about this and say you know what what if I had to think of a norm within my culture what would that what would that norm be as we said again trying to avoid the idea of stereotypes but really look at um, what might be a norm within the overall pragmatics. Um, so, oh, um, I, one of the things that I look at, because I told you that in um, England, um, British society, negative, uh, strong negative politeness is very important. Um, there's a, a, a sense in which you don't want to be drawn into something unless you're clear what the boundaries of that thing are, right? So one thing that I've noticed since I've lived in America 
um, which has been a long time now, but um, one thing that, that really sort of still occasionally happens to me is um, we don't do, Americans don't tend to do much pre-sequencing. So what we might call a pre-invitation. So they might say something like, oh, hey, Lucy, are you doing anything on Saturday? Well, my immediate instinct is to say, well, I don't know. It depends what you're going to ask me, right? If you're going to ask me if I want to go to the movies, maybe I'm not doing something. But if you're going to ask me to do you a favor, you know, if I say, oh, not much, I'll be, you know, probably working in the yard or something. And then you say, oh, because I've got to move, you know, everything out of my um you know my garage and i've only got one day and i was wondering if you could give me a few hours or a couple of hours with your truck you know or sales truck then of course i'm i'm gonna feel like oh you know this is way too much of a threat right this is not the way i want to spend one of my only two days off a week right that makes me sound like a horrible friend, but anyway. Um, so, for example, if you're in a culture that has a high negative base threat, then people tend to make the act less threatening. So they will include something like pre-sequences, such as these pre-invitations. So I'm about to ask you a huge favor, and it's fine if that's not possible. But on Saturday, I only had that one day to move everything out of my garage and da, da, da. Now, at this point, I know what it is. So then I can say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm in Dallas all day or I'm not, you know, but this gives me a chance to um, sort of understand what the, if the it, it's going to be a negative face threat right that's what you're giving me you're asking me to do something and it's it's not insignificant so you give me a chance to kind of work with that information and i've noticed that uh um it's not you know people don't tend to do that as much here as i would expect so more than once i felt um how would you say here on the back foot where i'm not sure what i should say because i'm not sure what it is that that um i'm actually going to be asked or not asked to do so um so i like pre-sequences or of certain kinds you know pre-invitations pre-sequences to give me an idea of where we might be about to go so that's just an idea of something that might happen between cultures right so may or may not happen between cultures that i would like pre-sequencing and i may be addressing or talking with somebody from another culture that doesn't necessarily do a great deal of pre-sequencing and that could result in some some sort of interesting uh, awkwardness between us right there really hasn't been a great deal um, that has been discussed beyond what we looked at in speech act theory, right? So, because obviously these are essentially um, speech acts, face threatening acts. So, in general, we know that students are ill equipped, which is not a surprise, right? Because these are not just linguistic issues they're pragmatic and linguistic issues so even if you have the pragmatic linguistic skill which a lot of students don't um, you're still missing the correct socio-pragmatics for the culture that you're in right so um here example that that we need um explicit instruction um so for example request making um you might you you would cover both of those things so you would cover pragma linguistics which would be ways of asking how might you ask you know who who would you be more direct with who might you be less direct with you know is it possible might you maybe you could i was wondering if so on um increasing or decreasing sort of degrees of um uh explicit politeness 
And then also socio-pragmatic rules, like what are the unwritten rules of the community? You know, is it in the speech community that you come from, the culture in which you come from, pretty huge favors are considered to be fine because you might then, someone would return that favor to you, right? So um, uh, there are cultures in which favors that I would never even consider might be might be taken for granted right and there are other cultures in which um anything that involves too much time or effort particularly if it's um if you're particularly low on the intimacy scale you know there's a great deal in um uh traditional inner circle cultures that has to do with intimacy and effort right the less intimacy the less effort that um, should be required or um, asked for, right, without causing some um, awkwardness or resentment on the person that you're asking. So um, in America, particularly, too much time, too much effort, situations that seem to involve family privacy. In other cultures, these are not such major concerns. So these are socio-pragmatic issues, right? So even if you ask nicely, you might be asking for something that's inappropriate, okay? Um, there is a study um, by Thomas who looked at both pragmatics and um, socio-pragmatics, uh, pragmalinguistics, excuse me, and socio-pragmatics. And um, she was looking between um, Russian and English. Um, so A says, and I, I've, again, I've cut and pasted this for you, are you coming to my party? B says, of course, which glosses as, yes, indeed, I wouldn't miss it for the world, right? Often, however, of course, implies the speaker has asked something which is self-evident. And so when transferred from Russian to English, it can sound, in answer to a genuine question, it can sound um, insulting, right? So is it a good restaurant? Of course, says the Russian speaker in English, whereas the English person might view that as meaning, um, well, why are you being so insulting to me? I'm just asking you if it's a good restaurant. Why would I, why would I know if it was a good restaurant or a bad restaurant, right? Here's another example. Is it open on Sunday? Of course, um, says the Russian. The interpretation of the English speaker might be, you know, oh, they now think that I'm really stupid and I don't realize that, um, uh, of course, the shops are going to be open um, all seven days of the week. Um, so that's a very specific kind of pragma linguistic marker that might be transferred from one language to the other, in this case, from Russian to English without the Russian speaker understanding there may be a misinterpretation of what they mean when they say, of course. Um, Thomas also looked at um, socio-pragmatics. And in this case, she looked at something I've talked about before, which is basically size of imposition. So whether, um, this is the idea of free or non-free goods, whether you're asking for something um that is acceptable or whether what you're asking for is too much um so this again uh was set in uh russia and um in britain matches were nearly free right basically so there was no need to use a particularly elaborate i was smoking in the 1980s and you know you wouldn't have a particularly elaborate strategy like hey have you got a light or can i borrow a light or you got a light right was that sort of straightforward it didn't matter if you didn't know this person before nobody thought that was a huge imposition for you to ask if they had a light for your cigarette 
What was interesting is in Eastern Europe in the 1980s, or, and I lived in Hungary during that time, so I know this to be true, um, cigarettes were virtually free. You could buy cigarettes for what in uh, our terms then would have been pennies. Um, and so often there was a minimal degree of politeness when someone asked you for a cigarette. So if you had a packet of cigarettes, someone in Hungarian or in Russia would say, uh, give me a cigarette, you know, or hey, got a cigarette in the same way that me might say, hey, got a light, right? But of course in Britain, um, that wasn't the case. Cigarettes, cigarettes were cheap, but they weren't that cheap. So it was inappropriate to, to, I mean, it was sort of inappropriate to ask, but if you were going to ask, you would certainly have to put a lot more effort into it than, hey, give me a cigarette, right? Because that would be considered incredibly rude. Um, I wondered if you had a cigarette to spare or gosh, you know, I, could really use a cigarette, but you know, you wouldn't do it in the same way because these were not free goods. And so the size of imposition was much higher. So that could be a mistake that an Eastern European um, may make coming from one culture to another. Um, another one for sociopragmatics would be, for example, taboo topics. So things that in one culture you can ask and in another culture you can't. So um, my understanding, although I have yet to go to China, my understanding is that in China it's perfectly reasonable to ask how much somebody earns. Um, in America it's not reasonable to ask how much somebody earns. Um, and those, you know, are... Uh, um, you sort of find those out the, the long hard way, usually if you live in another country, which ones you get into trouble for. And of course, asymmetrical power relations, everything can change, um, particularly in what we might consider very overtly hierarchical societies like Japan, for example, where the asymmetrical power relationship is coded down to the syntax and the morphology. There are certain um, phrases and things that you will use for someone who is either older than you, so demands more respect or, or is your boss or so on, and, and not your friend and so on. So those also, um, that's a socio-pragmatic issue. Now there, of course, you link up with pragmalinguistics because there are certain phrases, syntactical, morphological patterns that as a learner, you would learn. And then you would also learn were the ones to be used in deferential communication with someone who was um, of a different status than you who was older or who was hierarchically above you and so on. So that's, uh, um, that's where those two things um, can come together. Okay, so that's just to give you a general idea of politeness and co-optive principle. There's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. So anybody who's interested in doing that, um, this is a great area to sort of ferret out what has yet to be um, looked at within specific cultures and, and cross-culturally in general. If you have any questions, please send them in. Again, you can send them directly to me, uh, questions or comments at lucy.pickeringtamuk.edu, or you can send them through uh, Dr. Otardo at um, his email and he will let me know. Okay, thanks very much everybody, bye-bye.